Welcome back. In the second part of this topic, we will look at pain pathophysiology and pain assessment and management. Now, pain is usually a syndrome, which means it has many symptoms and signs and involvement of autonomic nervous system and so on. So what we'll do now, we'll look at some common pain presentations. Referred pain, a very important concept in clinical practice. Often a person feels pain in a part of the body that is fairly remote from the tissue causing the pain or tissue where the, the actual damage is occurring. For example, pain in one of the visceral organs often is referred to an area on the body surface. And a very common example is pain of angina or myocardial infarction. The injury is in the myocardium in the heart and the pain is usually felt in the left arm, forearm, jaw, right? The knowledge of different types of referred pain is important in clinical diagnosis because in many visceral ailments, the only clinical sign is referred pain. And the mechanism of referred pain is common origin of visceral and somatic nerve fibers in the embryo. So during development, the nerve fibers supplying the viscera and supplying the dermatome on the body surface arose from a common origin. Some of the common referred pains are shown in this picture. So pain coming from the heart, esophagus, stomach, so on and so forth. There's another type of pain called phantom limb pain. This is the pain sensed by amputees where the removed limb once was. This pain is often described as burning, cramps, tingling, electrical shock, itching or pins and needles. And it has been reported by majority of trauma and surgical amputees. The precise pathophysiology is unknown. However, a number of possible explanations have been hypothesized. Whatever the cause may be, this pain sometimes could be very annoying and may last for months to years requiring very complex management. Some other types of pain which are important in clinical practice are neuropathic pain, post-operative pain, and cancer pain. Now, neuropathic pain basically arises from the nervous system itself. The term is catch-all phrase for pain that occurs because of central or peripheral nervous system damage or dysfunction. So any problem in the neurons themselves, that is neuropathic pain. Post-operative pain is the pain that occurs after surgery. A very important point to remember here is anxiety and apprehension prior to surgery lead to high levels of pain post-operatively. So a good explanation to the patient about the surgical procedure, what to expect, and allaying their fears and anxiety helps in reducing post-operative pain. Unresolved pain can lead to a complicated post-surgical recovery. So it is very important that this aspect is uh, taken care of by the healthcare professionals who are involved in providing patients counseling before and after surgery. Third type of pain which occurs in cancer patients and it has a very high prevalence. The causes of cancer pain are wide and varied but the most common cancer pain is the one caused by bony metastasis. How do you evaluate pain? Not an easy task. And there is no single test that assesses an individual's level of pain. And despite numerous measures to provide an objective measure of pain, the most useful is asking the patient to relate the location, type, duration, as well as any therapies previously used to effectively treat pain. Children are often inadequately treated for pain, resulting in needless suffering. So do not assume that young children do not experience pain. And pain in a child needs to be assessed in the context of the child's age, developmental stage, family and cultural situation, and previous pain experiences. In infants and toddlers, observers can estimate pain by various scales, taking into account behaviors, vital signs, and sleep patterns, for example. 
In older children, a pictorial scale can be used with faces to show how much it hurts. The bottom graphic shows you a scale where children can basically look at it and describe their experience. The most common multi-dimensional pain assessment tool is the McGill Pain Questionnaire. It is a comprehensive questionnaire and used very frequently nowadays. It contains a series of adjectives that patients can use to describe their pain. Three aspects, sensory, affective, and evaluative. It also utilizes a rating scale where zero is no pain and five is excruciating pain. And the assessment of pain is based on three measures. As I said earlier, pain rating index, number of words selected, and the present pain index. This questionnaire is described in detail in the textbook, so please go and have a look at it. Now, how do you manage pain? As we have been discussing so far, that pain is not a simple sensation, and there are so many other signs and symptoms that come with pain, especially with chronic pain. So pain management is not an easy task and requires a comprehensive approach. Some basic principles are, number one, treat the cause of pain wherever possible, not just the symptom. Number two, make accurate assessment of pain extent and type. Number three, dose at regular specified intervals, particularly for chronic pain. So do not let people suffer in between the drug dosage. Integrate analgesia into a comprehensive patient management plan with a multidisciplinary approach and allow patient control over how much analgesia they would require. Number five, stepwise management. Doses should be stepped up the analgesic ladder as required for increasing pain or development of tolerance. And I'll talk about this ladder in the coming few slides. Last but not the least point, prevent side effects, especially if using opioids. Now, pain management involves pharmacological and also non-pharmacological interventions. Number one, the pharmacological part of pain management. There are key drug groups shown on this slide. Opioid analgesics and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are the ones we will look at at, um, in more detail, but there are other drugs which are important. Adjuvant analgesic medications can help when given with a main analgesic drug. Opioid antagonists are used when there is opioid overdose or toxicity. And there are some other analgesic drugs which work by different mechanisms of action and sometimes are useful. Now let's look at opioids first. Remember, we spoke about the built-in analgesia system in the previous part, where you have endorphins and caffeines. Although they work through the endogenous receptors, the exact mechanism is still not clear, despite decades of intensive research. Now, with opioid analgesics, pain perception and emotional responses are both altered. Thus, patients have reported that they could still feel the pain but it no longer worries them. They work at the spinal cord level, and as I said, they stimulate opioid receptors. They inhibit release of substance P from dorsal horn neurons, which is the main neurotransmitter involved in pain perception. At supraspinal levels, they activate opioid receptors, which are widely distributed within the central nervous system, especially within the limbic system, thalamus, hypothalamus and the midbrain and there are three types of receptors these are mu receptor kappa receptor and delta receptor different receptors have different distribution and different actions we're not going into details of those now tolerance to opioid effects develops very quickly and it may be due to both a gradual loss of inhibitory functions and an increase in excitatory signaling. And withdrawal from opioid analgesics is also a very common problem. These effects may be due to a rebound increase in cyclic AMP formation activated via delta opioid receptors. What are the effects of opioids in the central nervous system? Analgesia is the main, and which is the main use we are discussing right now. 
But there are many other effects of opioids. For example, suppression of cough reflex, suppression of the respiratory center in the medulla, which is actually the commonest cause of death from overdose of opioids. Sedation and sleep, hence they are called narcotic analgesics as well. Euphoria, the feeling of contentedness and well-being. Dysphoria, unpleasant feelings, hallucinations and nightmares. Meiosis, which is pupillary constriction. And in case of overdosage or poisoning, they could be pinpoint pupils. Nausea and vomiting, hypotension, bradycardia, tolerance, dependence and addiction, as we all know all the problems with opioid analgesic use. In the peripheral nervous system, again, analgesia is one of the main effects, plus anti-inflammatory effects as well. Decreased gut motility and increased tone in smooth muscles, that could lead to constipation, delayed gastric emptying, biliary colic, or even urinary retention. Suppression of some spinal reflexes and release of histamine, which causes bronchoconstriction and severe itching. Looking at the adverse drug reactions of opioids, the most serious one is respiratory depression, excessive sedation, dysphoria, constipation, nausea and vomiting, and of course, tolerance and dependence. Now, the cause of death from acute toxicity after an overdose of an opioid such as heroin is usually respiratory failure, and it is a central nervous system effect. What about the other group of drugs now, non-opioid analgesics? And we will look at NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. The most common non-opioid drug is actually paracetamol or acetaminophen. The precise action of paracetamol remains controversial despite it being the most widely used drug in the world. However, it is thought that it suppresses the production of prostaglandins, it also reduces fever, and sometimes you'll find that paracetamol is not regarded as an NSAID. It is classified as a separate drug. NSAIDs in general have significant anti-inflammatory actions and thus they reduce inflammation and also provide analgesia. Some of these drugs also inhibit platelet aggregation and thus they decrease the risk of thrombosis for example, low-dose aspirin. NSAIDs are effective for mild to moderate pain. They have useful opioid sparing effects, which means you can use them in combination with opioids so you can reduce the dose of opioid. Now, how do they work? When cells are damaged, they convert arachidonic acid into prostaglandins through the action of an enzyme called cyclooxygenase 2 or COX-2. Prostaglandins stimulate nociceptors. They also mediate inflammation. So when NSAIDs are given, they block the action of COX-2 enzyme. So prostaglandin levels go down, pain signaling goes down, and also inflammation is suppressed. COX inhibition accounts for most of the analgesic effects and also the adverse effects. Common adverse drug reaction to non-opioid analgesics include GI disorders, dyspepsia, nausea and vomiting, diarrhea, constipation and gastritis. Now this is because NSAIDs block prostaglandins and prostaglandins have a protective role in the GI mucosa. So by blocking prostaglandins there, NSAIDs make the gastric mucosa prone to be damaged by the acid. Hence NSAIDs are contraindicated in peptic ulcer disease. Other adverse effects include renal damage, particularly in elderly people, allergic reactions such as asthma, rashes and urticaria, and sodium retention, which could lead to consequent heart failure and hypertension in predisposed individuals. So it doesn't happen in everyone. It is a rare side effect. Now, after looking at the main groups of analgesics, let's talk about adjuvant analgesics. Now, these drugs are not primarily analgesics, but they can be combined with an analgesic and they provide pain relief. Some examples I will discuss here. Tricyclic antidepressants may be useful in neuropathic pain and are often used in combination with opioids for cancer-associated nerve pain as well. Corticosteroids such as dexamethasone 
helps relieve pain associated with inflammation and swelling. Psychoactive drugs like phenothiazines and benzodiazepines may also be useful uh, for their sedating, anti-anxiety and muscle relaxing properties. Bisphosphonates, which reduce bone turnover, are sometimes useful for metastatic or osteoporotic bone pain. Clonidine, which is a centrally acting alpha-2 adrenergic agonist and an antihypertensive agent, has been tried for the treatment of pain associated with diabetic neuropathy, post-herpetic neuralgia, spinal cord injury, phantom pain, and pain in cancer patients who are opioid tolerant. In the next slide, I'm going to talk about the ladder that I mentioned earlier. Now, this is called WHO ladder. It was produced back in 1986 to help combat cancer pain. However, it is now widely used to manage many different types of pain. It has three steps, each containing a recommended level of pharmacological treatment. If pain persists, the patient's treatment should be moved up to the next step. The goal is for the patient to be pain-free at the lowest point on the ladder. So step one involves the use of non-opioid drugs. Step two recommends adding a weak opioid and the final step advocates the use of strong opioids. Each step also suggests the use of an adjuvant. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, adjuvants are a range of drugs that have analgesic effects despite being normally prescribed for other conditions. Let's look at non-pharmacological analgesic techniques now. First aid techniques like rice, rest, ice, compression, elevation, heat packs, cold packs, physiotherapy, massage, trigger point therapy, and hydrotherapy also help. Uh, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation or TENS is becoming very popular these days. Acupuncture is postulated to be um, acting by releasing endorphins and encaphalines. Now the TENS machine, for example, uh, sends a constant stream of small electrical impulses through the skin. So these basically help by closing the gate, remember, the gate theory of pain, and also by releasing these intrinsic substances like endorphins and encaphalines. Psychotherapeutic methods like hypnosis, behavioral modification, uh, community support groups, family therapy and support, occupational therapy, and plus complementary and alternative medicine. Now, the, there is evidence of effectiveness for only a small number of techniques listed here. The use of non-pharmacological pain control is somewhat controversial, with many healthcare professionals being skeptical of the effectiveness of these techniques. Now, in summary, pain is one of the commonest presenting complaints. So, you will see a lot of patients in your clinical practice presenting with pain. It is a complex and highly subjective sensation, meaning that no two people are likely to experience the same level of pain for a given painful stimulus. Understanding the causes and pathophysiology of pain is important in choosing the right treatment. Make sure that you choose the right analgesic, follow the WHO ladder, watch out for adverse effects, and avoid under-treatment of pain. You don't want people to suffer unnecessarily. And chronic pain management may require multidisciplinary approach. So that's all for the topic, and I hope I was able to capture the complexity of pain sensation, its presentation, its management. Thank you so much. See you next time. Bye-bye for now.